أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما After beginning with the name of Allah and praising Allah and sending peace and salutations upon his Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, Then to all of the brothers and sisters here today uh, It's our great pleasure on behalf of the Masjid, Muhammad Masjid To invite you here today And we have great honor in inviting our guest here And having our guest speaker here um, In reality I don't think the Sheikh needs much of an introduction um, His work is uh, you know, Allahumma barik and may Allah put it in his mizan of hasanat yawm al qiyamah. His work is well known uh, and is fairly uh, viral on the internet. Um, no doubt, as a Muslim ummah and as a Muslim community, we are in need of good Muslim role models, people who are upon the kitab and the sunnah with the understanding of the salaf of this ummah. Uh, and so, for the younger brothers, when we are looking for people to look up to and aspire to, it shouldn't be the footballers and the movie stars and the music stars, etc. Allah Jalla wa Ala, He tells us, Cooperate upon righteousness and piety. And so when we have brothers who are going out in the way of Allah and they're calling Muslims and non-Muslims to Islam, because it's not just the non-Muslims who need this message. Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, He says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who believe, aminu. Allah then says, believe in Allah and His Messenger. So we as believers, we need to check our aqeedah, we need to check our belief and our manhaj and our methodology. So, Shaykh Usman ibn Farooq, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, um, I know you're here to listen to him, so I'm not going to give a lengthy introduction, but we ask Allah, by his greatest of names, we ask Allah Jalla wa Ala that he keeps him protected from the evil and the shayateen, from amongst the jinn and mankind. And we ask Allah that he allows us to benefit from him and that we can follow in the footsteps uh, that he is uh, blazing ahead. Uh, so without further ado, Shaykhana, Barak Allah Fikum, Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. Alhamdulillah. First and foremost, I want to thank uh, the masjid here and the sheikh for his uh, rather generous introduction. I don't think I'm deserving of it, but may Allah reward him for his husn uh, Um Secondly, I see a beautiful community and I see uh, beautiful faces and a beautiful packed masjid. And I see a great effort to grow I see buildings to my right and I see buildings in front of me that are being built to grow the community. And I encourage all the brothers and sisters here to partake. And they didn't ask me to do this. They didn't ask me to fundraise or anything like that. But from my own, I want everybody to partake in trying to develop this community, this beautiful community. What you can from your own abilities, from your wealth, from your time. Because when we come to the United Kingdom from the US, we see, alhamdulillah, a unity. We see uh, some fit and true, but we see a development of the community growing and it makes us very happy. Because you guys are ahead of us. Alhamdulillah, you guys are ahead of us. We are behind you. Your chai is really good. You got tons of halal food joints. And MashaAllah, la billah. Your massage is their next level. They're, and, and not only do you have big Masajid, they're full. Alhamdulillah. We want everybody to help 
and uh, developing this community and uh, making sure that these projects, the phases that are going on, they're successful. Regarding the subject today, and this is regarding the Ahlul Hadith and the history of the Ahlul Hadith and the development as we see in our time, it's a very important subject because in our time, one of the fitan we see, one of the trials or tests that we have upon this ummah is a lot of division and division based on a lot of misconceptions. You know? When I was very young, I used to live in the United Kingdom and I used to live, I'm not going to mention the name of the city now, I think some of you have heard it already. And I was maybe six, seven years old. I didn't know much about Islam and peace. One of my uncles, I mean, uncle through marriage, he uh, asked me some questions about Islam, just, you know, basic things. And he was not very practicing himself. And then he told me, do you know what a Wahhabi is? And I, have, I told him, I have no idea what a Wahhabi is. Seven years old, little kid, what is a Wahhabi? He said, whatever you do in life, stay away from him. They marry their sisters, they drink blood, they hate the Prophet I was like, man, these are some scary people, right? And then I, yeah, I remembered this conversation and then خلاص, I mean, uh, for a long time, I didn't know anything about the religion. I was away from the religion, didn't know much. Then when I started to get back towards the religion, all kinds of groups came. You know, this group and this group and named after this city and named after that city and named after this and that. And then in my city, in San Diego, California, we didn't have any people or Ahlul Hadith and things. It was a, I mean, we had some people who would be like with the methodology of Ikhwan, some with Jamaat Tabliq and things like this. On my own, I started to read. And I started to read about different groups and different backgrounds. And one of the things I found about was Ahlul Hadith, Ashab al Hadith. And I want to clarify. I'm not talking about a political group. I'm not talking about a sect that developed that has like, you know, this is their leadership and you must join this uh, conference to get a ticket or something like this. I'm talking about the actual methodology. Okay. And I was told all these things, but when I started to read about the earliest times, and in the time, for example, Harun al-Rashid in Tariq, when he talked about that I looked for different things, and it's a long narration. For example, he said, I looked for what is the reality of lying, and I found it in the Rafidah, his statement, right? And he said, I looked for haq, the truth, I found it with the Ashab al Hadith, the people of Hadith. Harun al Rashid, like, I mean, this is not something recent. And Ibn Abdul Hadi, the great scholar, he has a tarajim of the people of Hadith, and you will find from the earliest scholars being put there, from the Ahlul Hadith. Meaning this is not some sect that developed, this is not some division, this is not some new group, this is not a political party, it's not that if you wear a certain style of clothing then you're Ahlul Hadith and if you don't you're not. And that's why you'll see me switch up clothing a lot. Sometimes I wear the Imama, sometimes I wear a Shimao, sometimes I just do the Quran Surah, sometimes I have Air Force Ones on, right? To let you guys know this is not like a style, like okay if you wear a Shimao then you're there, so if you wear an Imama then this is not the way it works. And it's not tied to any one country. It's not like it's just Saudi or just this country or that country. No. The people of Hadith who stick to the evidences have always been a part of this ummah. And they've always been uh, I mean, an and ulema. And some people have this idea that they have like a, a dislike for the imam. And this is a fallacy. This is not true. The true people who love Hadith they love the a'imma. I and mean, some people, they have a great ta'asub, a great partisanship. They will love one imam and they will unfortunately speak ill or try to downplay the other a'imma. And that's a disease because all these a'imma are our a'imma. We love them all. And you imagine if you were sitting in Kufa and you were sitting with Qadi Abu Yusuf and Imam Muhammad al-Shaybani and Imam Abu Hanifa, of course. These are people, the scholars, you, you think you would disrespect them? Never. Imagine if you were in Medina, in Masjid al Nabawi, and Imam Malik is narrating hadith, you wouldn't sit at his feet? You love it. Imagine you're with a Shafi'i, Muhammad ibn Idris al Shafi'i, and he, and he is 
narrating his risala or his fatawa that would be recorded in al um you wouldn't sit and benefit from him imagine you're sitting in baghdad and you're sitting with imam ahmad ibn hanbal and he's narrating the hadith that later were recorded as the musnad when he's sitting you're sitting and they're sitting with you taking hadith from him the likes of imam abu dawood you wouldn't benefit from him we love these a'imma and these a'imma are the people of hadith for example imam ahmad people talk about the hanbali madhab and so on but imam ahmad I mean, the, the biggest, voluminous work that he did is in Hadith, the Musnad. Abu Dawood and Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah and Nisa'i, these Imam al-Bukhari and Muslim, who doesn't love them? These are the Ashab al-Hadith. These are the Ahl al-Hadith. These are the Alimat that we follow and we love. And many of them would be Shafi'i in Fiqh or Hanbali in Fiqh or Maliki in Fiqh or Hanafi in Fiqh. Because they didn't divide on this. They stuck to those who stuck to the hadith, who narrated a hadith, who reported a hadith, who loved a hadith, they are the ones that are called Ashab al-Hadith. Imam Shafi'i, the great scholar of Islam, he said that if you see the people of hadith, it is as if you've seen Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Not to say you're going to be a Sahabi, okay, take it easy. But it is as if you've seen Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Why? He said because the people of hadith sit around and they talk about qala rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam faja'a nabi alayhi salatu wasallam fahakada and they talk about the af'al the actions of rasulullah so the aqwal the statements of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the people of hadith they're constantly discussing hadith how the prophet prayed how he did hajj how did he sleep how did he wake how did he do ghusl so it fits an image when you sit with those types of people it is as if you're sitting with rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam some people you sit with and all they discuss is this peer, he went to this place and this person, I was sitting in a gathering myself, I'm not narrating something. And he said that there was a, there was a peer, and I won't mention names here, and he was giving khutbah and there was a guy in the audience that had to go to the bathroom, Qada al Haja, And somehow this peer figured out who it is. Right? And he comes down, he puts his shawl around him, and the guy's qada al haja was no longer needed. I'm not kidding. I heard it myself. Right? And he continued the khutbah. He told him, you don't need to refresh your wudu. It's a mobile toilet. <laughs> like, uh, what's the benefit here? I mean, talk about qala Allah, qala Rasul alayhi salatu salam. Talk about, yani qal Amr, Abu Bakr, Uthman, Ali, Hassan, Hussein, Abu Huraira, Ibn Mas'ud. These are the sahaba, the salaf. That's beneficial. What's the point of talking about, you know, he went here and bandits came and they couldn't find money and then the money disappeared and then he showed it to them and then he did a backflip and then he flew. I mean, we as a people of hadith, we believe in awliya. There are awliya of Allah, awliya of Rahman. The Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he has al-Furqan, bainya awliya of Rahman wa awliya of Shaytan. We believe that, that those awliya are blessed with karamat. It's not that we deny that. But what is the point of mu'ajizat al-anbiya? When the anbiya, the prophets, have miracles, the point is for you to know he's a true prophet. What is the point of karamat? Of like something that may happen that is extraordinary to, to, the, to a wali of Allah, like a sahabi. That is a blessing for him. That is not to show him to be Yani something uh, different than others. That is a gift for them. And I, I am emphasizing on this because I have to warn you what every Nabi warned their nation about. What was that? The Dajjal. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had told us that every Nabi warned his people about Dajjal. Dajjal, the fitna of Dajjal that we ask refuge from in Salah, the fitna of Dajjal that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked for refuge from. The fitna of Dajjal that, and this is related to Ashab al-Hadith, don't think I'm off topic here. Uh, this fitna that every Nabi warned his nation about. When Dajjal comes, he will show you apparently 
miraculous thing. What does that mean? Imagine today, if I'm talking to somebody and they tell me, our sheikh said this, and I say, my sheikh told me this, and we go back and forth, right? And I tell them, look, what my sheikh is here, supported by the ayah of Quran. Here, Sahih Hadith. Here is the Sanad of the Hadith. Here is the Aqwal of Sahaba. And they come back and they say, yeah, but my sheikh, he has kash, 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 what is it called? Kash, right? Huh? He gets into hal, he jumps, and he gets into a trance, and he gets all these kinds. Of, so, so you see, it's not a dalil. You're bringing physical what you see, right? And this conversations happen. I had a brother from Turkey. They used to live in San Diego. And I had a long discussion with him about Mawlid. And I came to the masjid with a stack of books, like from here, maybe it would touch the roof. And we had put piles. And I was showing him dalil after dalil after hadith, and showing him evidence from earlier a'imma and later a'imma, when it started, and books of tariq, and bidaya wa nihaya, and this and this and this. He didn't bring even a paper with him. After my half an hour explaining, and this is not like I wasn't a debate, or wasn't, it was just me and him sitting. Right? After all of that, he said, my sheikh, he gets wahi. Well, I'm, I kid you not. And he used to wear a picture of his sheikh. Like he used to have it. He didn't wear it regularly. But then he would show us pictures. When they would wear a picture, he said, you can't make dhikr without looking at a picture of the sheikh. So he would look at that. So now what happened is, I'm giving him dalil after dalil after dalil. And he tells me, no, 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 no. You don't understand. Our sheikh, he flies in the sky. And he does these things. And he gets wahi. And he starts to tremble, and then he tells us, and he told us it's sunnah. So it's sunnah. I, wallahi, I swear by Allah, I'm not kidding. I am, I'm making a qasam. I don't like to take qasam. There's a brother. Now, I won't give his name. and He's not famous. not like you would know him. And I don't want to backbite. But he's somebody I know personally. He used to study. Uh, he was with us in America. And his father used to be Ismaili. I mean, they were a sect, al Khani. He became Muslim, alhamdulillah, we were very happy. And he sent his son to study in Pakistan. And they were originally Indians, so they had like, American citizens, but they had some issues with the visas and political situations. They ended up studying in Malaysia. And it was a madrasa that was like, I, I don't know who they were. I met him when I was in Emirates. I was in UAE and I met him. And I knew him and when he was very young, the son. I knew the father too, and I met him. And he came to my house and we were talking. Wallahi, I'm not kidding. This is taking Qasam again just to make sure you guys and he told me that our sheikh is 4,000 years old so, wow that's, that's pretty old and he started to tell me some of the things his sheikh said and they were all against hadith that's an makhi but here is a hadith in al-Bukhari he said look Imam Bukhari as these three or four narrators between him and Rasulullah. But our Shaykh, he heard it directly from Rasulullah. Wow. I want to meet your Shaykh. He said, But our Shaykh teaches naked. <laughs> I'm telling you, I wish I was making this up, but I'm not. I told him, Ittaqillah. You look at the aura of a man, he says, See, Wahhabis, Zahiris, you guys look, he's invisible. And this guy is half of the Quran. He's, I mean, the invisible, naked, 4,000 year old Sheikh. I told him, I don't know what jinn is teaching you guys, but ask Allah, this is for the bathroom, say it before going to your madrasa. So the people of Hadith are not like this. The people of Hadith. From the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, from the time of the Sahaba, from the time of the Tabi'un, they are the ones that said, "No, we're going to look at the Hadith. We're not just going to sit here in Qiyas and in Ra'i and in this and this. We're going to look at Hadith. We're going to look at the evidences." Now we come back to the Jal. You guys think I'm lost, but I'm not. I'm connecting it all together. When the Jal comes, he's going to show you amazing things. May Allah protect us. May Allah make it that we never face the job. Don't think you're gangster, you're going to be like taking the job on. Imagine somebody who can show you Jannah. 
Hey, that's a fitna. That is a fitna. Right? Today, if somebody can and he makes zikr while doing a backflip, you're, you're already like, wow, he's awliya. But imagine somebody who could show you a picture of Jannah and take you and put it in it. Even though that will end you and put you in nar, but from the appearance of it, he'll, the ones who just go by looking, like, oh, this sheikh, he gets electric shock. I'm sure you've seen the videos, right? He shakes hand, he shocks him. I don't know. Like a buzzer or something? I don't know. Right? But that's their dalil for why he's han haq. He shocks people. Uh, electric mullah. Yeah? If that's the dalil, then you'll definitely be following the jal. Imagine he can show you the nar and pick you up and throw you in it. And even though that will end you in Jannah, but look, look at that test. So if you are not from the people of Hadith, if you are not who sticks to the sunnah, you're not who sticks to the dalil, you'll be like, look, you guys are just sitting here reading books. This guy is putting me in Jannah right now. I'm not even waiting for the Day of Judgment. So I see it. No. We don't go by this. We go by Qala Allah or Qala Rasul alayhi salatu And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam warned us of this. He warned us of this. And he told us about a young man that will face the Jal. And the Jal will tell him, believe in me. The young man will, the jal will cut him in half, split him in two, and walk between him and come back. For that, talk about some karamat stuff. I mean, like, you know, if that's what you're about, you know, this sheikh, he wrote a taweez, and then suddenly my headache went away, right? If that's what you're about, man, you're going to go with it. You're going to go with it. You, like you guys are talking about Takhreej and Ulum and this guy split a guy in half, walked in the middle, put him back together, he gave life to the dead. This is how ignorant people would be, that that's how they would think. But that young man is a person of Iman. He sticks to the Hadith. So the Dajjal tells him, now that I put you back together, now, now will you believe in me? Young man will say, first, I suspected you were Dajjal. Now, I know you're Dajjal. I will not believe in you. Why? Because even whatever you're showing me, I know the hadith. I know the Rasul warned us about this. So now when I see these signs, no way. And I'm summarizing in, uh, from the hadith and I'm putting these from my words. I'm not saying there's a hadith in, in the hadith. That this young man, when he knew the evidences and stuck to the evidences, that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used to protect him. So now, even when Dajjal tries to kill him, he cannot kill him. Allah will protect him. Because it's a test whether he was going to go by what he sees or whether he was going to stick to what he knows from Hadith. And that is the people of Hadith that stick to the Hadith. Ashab al Hadith or Ahlul Hadith. They are the ones that Abu Yusuf, Qadi Abu Yusuf, the student Abu Hanifa, once he was sitting at his door and he saw the people of Hadith walking by, he said, Wallahi, I serve Allah. That these are the best people on the face of the earth. Al Baghdadi, Al Khatib al Baghdadi, his books, Sharf Ashab al Hadith. Read it. Read those narrations. So, this is the key here. As Muslims, we have tests today. We have masajid that will be built on qubur. There will be a qabr. I've seen it. A grave. That will be there first, and then they'll build a masjid around it. And you will walk in the masjid and you'll see a qabr there. And then they'll add Sharif next to it. I don't know why. And we know that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbid that. We know Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbid that. So now you have a choice. Are you going to be from Ashab al-Hadith? Are you going to be from Ahlul Hadith, the people of Hadith that say, no, the Prophet ﷺ forbid this. So we're not going to go pray and take the place of Qubur to be places of Salah. Or are you going to be from those that say, you know what, in my culture we do it. In my madhab, in my this, in my firqa, in my aidat, so what, they have really good dal, their gulab jamans are the best. 
this is the, this is a fitna. And as funny as that sounds, I was in, I'm not going to mention the name of the country. I was in another country. I won't offend anybody. And they had these massages, and I saw them myself, and I was shocked. I mean, being as ignorant as I am, and as sheltered as we are in America, we don't see this. When I saw it, I was telling people, like, what are you guys doing? They said, Papa, you know the hadith? You're Muslim, you have a beard. How could you do this? They're like, no, no, you don't know. You're Wahhabi. I don't drink blood. <laughs> huh? This whole labeling of Wahhabi, this is a, a trick nowadays. And the kuffar are playing with it on the news. And you could be whatever, but if you make salah and you believe in hijab and you believe in Quran and sunnah, khalas, you're a Wahhabist. And suddenly you're a bad guy. One of my friends, his brother-in-law used to study in Syria. And they had banned the Shia of the government had banned the books of Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Al-Qayyim, great scholars of Islam. One time he was going from Jordan to go back to his studies a long time ago. And the border guards, they stopped him. And when they were searching him, they found the book of Ibn Taymiyyah. They told him, you can't take this. He said, why? He said, it's a Wahhabi book. He told him, that's amazing. Because he was born hundreds of years, Ibn Taymiyyah, hundreds of years before Muhammad Abdul Wahhab. So how did he become Wahhabi? <laughs> Even though he was born hundreds of years before Muhammad al Wahhab, they said, cancel visa, go get out. <laughs> he said, Alhamdulillah, khalas, I'm good. Uh, so these are just tricks. The people of Hadith are not tied to a person. Not Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, rahmatullah Ali. Not uh, Shaykh ibn Baz or Shaykh ibn Al-Taymin or Shaykh Al-Bani or Shaykh this or Shaykh that. No, they are, we love all the a'imma and alima that are on the Quran and Sunnah. We respect the imma and ulama that are on the Quran and Sunnah and the way of the Salaf al Ummah, but we are tied to call Allah or call Allah Rasul. That's why this didn't become a, a named after a person, but after sticking to the evidences. And that's why sometimes between us we may have khilaf on issue, on a fiqh issue, we may disagree. But we always go back to the evidences. And that is the people of Hadith. And you will find the greatest and the earliest of them outside the Arabian Peninsula. And when we talk about the great scholars like Shah Ismail Shaheed and others, you will find them, their history, outside. And it's not tied to any government. You will find them in every part of the world. I've traveled many other countries, you will find the people that stick to the evidences, the people who stick to the hadith. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from them. We ask Allah subhanahu to make us from those that love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his sunnah and make ittiba'a and make the uh, yani obedience to the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam over anybody else. More than walid than walad and nas ajma'in. More than the fathers and children and all of mankind. They love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. with action. Lisan al-hal. With the, with the tongue of the condition, not just qawlan wal lisan maqal, not just in statement and what you say, but in action. When you learn that this is the sunnah, you don't care what your culture is. You don't care what anybody, your parents, your uncles, your, your background, your country. No, I love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa so I love his sunnah above all of that. I love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa so I give precedence to that over anything else. And that is the people of Hadith. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from them. Jazakumullahu khayran. They have requested me to give a short reminder in Pashto. And I usually don't uh, speak other than in English or sometimes Arabic just because I don't believe in nationalism. But uh, since it's been requested, they say Al Amr Fuq Al Adab, I will inshallah give a short talk. I apologize for those that don't speak Pashto. Uh, it will not contain anything that I didn't already mention. So don't worry about it. Allahu Khairan. We'll open up the question and answer now. First of all, you're trying to hide your popularity or something. Go ahead, Abi. 
خلاص because you have a gift you can ask two I'm just kidding بارك الله فيكم الله خير Those are really great questions. Each one of them could be a book by themselves. But I'll give you a short answer. First, I'll repeat the question. The first part of the question, correct me if I incorrectly summarize it, is what is the ideal daily routine to be from the people that are in the highest levels of Jannah? Man, I'm the wrong person to ask. Maybe you should ask the Sheikh this or something, you know, because my daily routine is horrible. <laughs> um, yani, the abrar of the people that are sadiqun, the people who are forerunners, the people who are from the people of Jannah, you will find in them many qualities. And there are books written about those. So I will just mention a few. First thing, don't waste time. One of the sifat of the people of Jannah is that they will not hear in it any kadab, any lies or useless talk. Right. One of the great scholars, Shaykh Abdul Salam Rustami, in his tafsir, when he talked about this ayah, he said about this ayah that this sifa or this gift will be given to them in Jannah because they had this quality in dunya. They didn't like to listen to useless talk or lies. But in dunya, sometimes you have no choice. Like you're sitting and your uncle comes and he starts talking about Pakistani politics or something like this, and you're like, ah. I could be reading Quran right now. And then, what, what can you do, right? Be polite. You kind of have to put up with it. Somebody comes and they're like, oh, did you hear this sheikh? He was in a bar and this. And you're like, ah, okay. Okay, inshallah, we'll look into it. You know, you kind of, you have to put up with it in dunya, right? But in Jannah, Allah blesses the people of Iman with that. Right? So bring those sifat in your life. Don't waste time. Don't listen to backbiting or lying or useless talk, right? Bring those sifat into yourself because this is what kills us. People often ask me, like, how do you have time to work a job and have family and homeschool kids and do da'wah and teach durus? And they're like, we don't have time. But then they're like, what did you do last weekend? Oh, we watched the soccer and football, a football game and it was great. And then we followed, we went to the movies and then we went out for shisha. Like, wow, man, you got a lot of time on your hands, right? People that sit around watching videos to find faults, man, you got a lot of time on your hands. People that sit around watching TikTok cat videos. I've seen people sit and just squirrel through like 10 seconds per video and spend two, three hours doing them. At the end, they don't even remember what they watched. People have time to waste. If I ask you guys, you won't answer me, but I'll ask you anyway, right? Uh, what's the best football team, right? Somebody will say Manchester United, somebody will say City, somebody will say, I don't know, whatever teams are out there, uh, Birmingham something, I know we went over the two teams here yesterday, right? Somebody will say the Raiders, no, I'm just kidding, American football team, right? And if I tell you why, some of you will be able to give me some great statistics. This player, he ran these many yards or feet or kilometers, or whatever you guys have here, right? And he kicked these many balls into a net, and he'd stop these many balls from going in. Man, that is some knowledge. How did you learn all that? How did you have time for that? I was in America, one brother was telling me about baseball players and football players, and he hit these many balls, and he hit, I don't care how many balls he hit. It doesn't really matter to me. What does it matter to you? Does he know you? No. Does it benefit you? No. But people have time for that. Don't waste time. Imam Ahmad. His son Abdullah says he used to make when he was in prison 300 nafal raka'at a day and night, day and night. 300. And I don't mean the, you know, you know the, the 23 raka'at in 20 minutes. I don't mean that kind of salah. I mean that he would make proper salah in that many. That's amazing, right? 
How? They didn't waste time. Imam Ahmed used to sew silver on the pants with his own hand. It's a lowly job. But he didn't take money. He was that. Urdu mein kehte hain khuddar. And he would sew the silver, but he had that ghira. He didn't want to beg people. He wanted. The students would tell him, instead of this, you should yani, uh, take money from people. We will give you. And then do hadith at that time. Read hadith, memorize. He says, no, I want to do it on my own. But he didn't waste time, so he memorized a million hadith. Alf, alf. Thousand, thousand. Right? These were the salaf that didn't waste time. That's the first thing. Second thing, have taqwa of Allah. You know, Bishr al-Hafi, famous Bishr al-Hafi, Zahid, Baghdad, he had a sister. And his sister once came to Imam Ahmad. And Imam Ahmad used to have a time where he would ask, he would allow people to ask questions. And from them, from covered, would be women. So she came and she asked the question. She said, Imam, I saw clothed and he has a, as a living and sometimes I sew at night and listen to this question he said when I would sew at night I have a candle lit so I sew with it when the soldiers or the police patrol they are like the street was a little bit above her and where her door was above and they had any yeah, windows that would be covered but when they go by from their lanterns the light shines our room even though there was a curtain right? so she said at that time if i leave my candle on then i feel this to be a waste Isra, because there's light coming from them and i'm i'm light so i put out my candle when they go by and when they're gone i light it again that's not even the question right because i don't want to waste with both lights the question was do I owe them money because the light that goes by, I'm using it to sow. So do I owe them a share of the money to them? Imam Ahmed said, who are you? She said, I'm Ukht Bishar al Hafi." He said, Wallahi wara and taqwa comes from your household. And he started crying. He said, look at the taqwa of this woman. And she was worried that Allah would hold her accountable because the light from the, I mean, the lanterns that they would be walking around, checking the night in, was used to benefit her in sewing. So she would take then maybe a part of that to give it to them. That that's how concerned she was about fulfilling the hukuk. Imagine that. Today, we have brothers with beard. They're taking qasam. They'll rip you off for a million pounds. I was in another country. Not going to mention the name. No, really, I'm not going to mention the name. And this guy was selling uh, semi-precious stones. And he was taking qasam. Wallahi, billahi, tullahi. This is this. And, and if this is not, my wife is talaq on me. And this and this. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Guy, I don't have to go all that. I just ask you for the real, man. <laughs> like, take it easy, right? I'm not interested in stones and stuff. So I didn't buy any. Somebody else bought some. Turned out they were fake. <laughs> Started thinking, man, this guy just made his wife talaq on him. For what? A like, thousand rupees? <laughs> like, what are you going to do with it? Imagine the rest of your life you're with your wife, zina. How could you do that? I mean, how, where is the taqwa? So live your life by taqwa. Remember that Allah sees you. So don't waste time, have taqwa. Well, that's enough for today because it's very long. What was, hold on, I had a second one. What was the second one? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The one that's going to get me in trouble. Okay. Regarding our brothers and sisters, whether it's in yani, uh, East Turkmenistan, which is currently occupied by China, or our brothers and sisters in Palestine, or our brothers and sisters in Kashmir, or our brothers and sisters in other part of the world, no doubt we need to feel their pain. And this is not politics. Somebody says, well, you're talking about politics. No. If I feel the pain of my brothers and sisters being oppressed and killed, it's not politics. That's part of my iman, to love the ummah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us the ummah is like one body. When one part's in pain, the whole body is awake in sleeplessness and fever and feeling that pain, right? So he gave that example of one body. But 
what is the solution? Some people say, let's protest. First thing, we don't find that from the way of the Salaf. We didn't see like when the Quraysh were doing their thing, Sahaba in the street with signs, you know, let Muhammad free. I mean, we don't find that. Secondly, just from a practical perspective, I don't think protesting works, to be honest. Right? I don't see it from the way of the Salaf. And I don't see it effective. How many years have people been protesting for Tibet? Free Tibet, free Tibet, free Tibet. Dalai Lama bounced, didn't want to stay and handle it. Got rid of the armed resistance in Tibet because he's sitting in the UK having tea with your queen. And protests and movie stars and stickers on cars, free Tibet, and politicians, free Tibet. And China's like, do something, bro. We ain't free none. How many protests have we had for Palestine? Was Muslims. Streets, especially in the UK, mashallah, you guys pack them streets, right? You think Israel cares? No. The world doesn't listen except with might. So strengthen yourself. Strengthen your iman. Strengthen your aqidah. Stop bickering amongst each other. Stop backbiting each other. Come together as an ummah on the Quran and Sunnah and stand. We are in shambles. I mean, many of our aqaid are, are corrupted. I was in Palestine. I was in Quds. And the first time I went there, I was with my friend and his parents. So my first time, and Quds is not like Al-Haram in Mecca where you see the clock tower and you know exactly where to go even though you're outside of Mecca. But in Medina where all roads lead to the Haram and Medina. Quds is designed by... Uh, I mean, parts of it by Salahuddin Ayyubi in his time, where the roads are very small, narrow, and they turn. And the point of that was that if an army tried to attack, they couldn't go straight to it. They had to go through these roads, and people would be on top of the roofs, women and men, and throwing hot oil or whatever to try to slow them down. So when you go, it's not like a direct shot. You go these little streets that turn and turn and turn, and they're all closed, and then boom, you hit these big green doors, and you find them. So I didn't know where to go. So we see these young brothers, young Palestinian brothers, mashallah, and we told them, which way, where is Aqsa? And they were like, come me, like, uncle, come. Not to me, I'm young. He was like my friend's dad, right? He told him, come. And he showed us the way, and he showed us the big gate. And it was Maghrib. We were going for Salah. And we're like, ta'al man, they come with us. We're like, yalla, anti They stood there, smoking cigarettes, on little motorcycles, until we went for main Salah and came out, they were still standing there. If you're in front of the haram, not making salah, and not the haram, but where's the aqsa? Yeah. How is it going to free? We need to fix ourselves, right? To start with making dua for them. Like when something happens, make qulut, the fajr for them, go to nazira, right? Start by fixing your community, coming together. And when you stand together with strength, then the world will listen. Yeah. <laughs> So he asked the question that if somebody makes a mistake in hadith, out of ignorance or as a mistake in the sanad or the matan and the wording or the chain of the hadith, they make a mistake because either Arabic is not their language or maybe they're ignorant of the sanad, is there a sin? الجواب إذا هو يستطيع يعلم ما هو السند الصحيح المتصل كرجال أو مثلا ومتعمدا هو يقلب الألفاظ أو يعني يتكلم بالخطأ متعمدا هذا إثم وإذا جهلا أو خطأ هذا ليس الإثم لكن لابد عليه أن ينظر في الكتب الحديث ويجلس مع العلماء وانظر على ما هو السند الصحيح سالما ما هو مثلا الصحيح so the first answer is that if somebody and knowingly messes with the wording of hadith or the sanad of a hadith, then this is a sin. 
and it could make their maqad fil nar yani their seat in the hellfire as we know from the famous hadith of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam like that is mutamida knowing if somebody unknowingly makes a mistake in the sanad or makes a mistake in the wording of the hadith this is not a sin because rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said my ummah has been forgiven for that which is done unintentionally or by mistake or out of forgetfulness but a person who's going to be narrating a hadith and asanid should do their best to check the books of hadith or sit with the ulama and know what they are doing and what they're saying to be correct. But if it's an accident, again, that is not a sin. Okay. ตัวเราสอบนะมีอะไรอยู่ไหมครับเรียนรู้ว่าเราสอบนะมีอะไรอยู่ไหมเรียนรู้ว่าเราสอบนะมีอะไรอยู่ไหมเรียนรู้ว
in Iran, at that time, their supreme leader had a whole secret service. They had a military. They had spies. They fought Iraq for so many years. They had weapons. He could have just sent one guy, right? But he didn't want to. He just wanted to make a show. So he made the guy popular. And people that had never heard of him started to buy that book and read it. And even though it's rubbish, it's sold because of the controversy. There's no such thing as bad publicity, right? So Muslims have to be smarter than that. Muslims have to be smarter than that. When somebody makes these kinds of things, and we start having protests, and we start doing Twitter, and you know, people have been sending me, oh, look at this movie. Why are you sending it to me? You're promoting it. Every time you click on it, now YouTube's going to make it more popular. Now those algorithms are going to pick it up. Ignore that stuff. Sometimes you have, because what are you going to do? You're going to go find the producers and do what? Right? And if you do something to them, they're just going to make more. Right? What you have to do is start to educate people. Learn yourself first. What is the true history? I have a series on the Khilaf of Abu Bakr, the Khilaf of Amr, Khilaf of Uthman, Khilaf of Ali, the Khilaf of Muawiyah, Hassan, and what happened in the Khilaf of the Sahaba. And we base it on authentic narration. And we give references from the books in it. Watch them, learn, and educate the community with what's right. So you can counter it with knowledge, not with emotion. This is my advice. Wallahu Fadl Habibi. Alaikum as You're next. Good to see you again. Khalas, two questions for you then. Excellent question. When giving da'wah to non-Muslims, what is the best way to provide evidences from the Qur'an, from the hadith? And if you see my videos, we do exactly that. We give da'wah using the Qur'an, the miracles of the Qur'an. We give da'wah using the hadith, meaning the miracles of the Prophet which we know from hadith. We give da'wah from showing the non-Muslims the ayat of Allah, the signs of Allah within themselves, and in the samawat, in the sky, the earth, and that's what the Quran tells us. And that is going to be all together in your da'wah. That's going to be all together. The first thing with non-Muslims, ask them what they know about Islam. See what background they're coming from. If they're atheists, if they're Christian, if they know a lot, if they don't know a lot. And then calibrate your da'wah accordingly. And if they know a lot, go deeper. If they don't know, then let me give me one minute, give me two minutes, let me just tell you the basics. We believe in one Allah. We believe that Allah has always been there, always be there. Allah has no children. Allah has you know, basics, which are from the Quran, but you don't have to recite the whole Quran to them or so what because I mean, this is not the time that you have. Give them that basics. And then one of the things which is really good in da'wah is to ask a non-Muslim what is holding you back from accepting Islam. And then whatever ishkalat they bring, clear those up. And then say, okay, now you ready? Push that a little bit. The second. Friend of mine, I got you. Uh, JWs, Jehovah's Witnesses, have a very strange belief. They do not believe like us. They, they, they believe Isa ibn Maryam was an angel. They have some strange beliefs. And they only believe, I forgot, 1,000 something people or 100,000. Some very small number of people go to Jannah. That's it. I asked one, like, what are your chances? He said, not good. <laughs> so, Jehovah's Witnesses have many other strange beliefs, but they still believe in the Bible. And they have uh, what's called the New World Translation. And what I would do, if you were going to give da'wah to them, is get, tell him, let me see your Bible. And then you can see our Bible verses that are contradictory and show him those contradictions from the Bible. And once the Bible is out of the way, then give him the message of hope. So in the deen, if somebody brings a new celebration or a new prayer or a new this or a new that or Chalisma Sharif and Urs Sharif and this Sharif and that Sharif and all of this stuff, 
we will reject them unless they have evidence from the Quran or Sahih Hadith or the action of the Khulafa or so on. In regular life, Rasulullah he saw different people make different decisions and he did not forbid them. For example, Sahaba were eating a type of book, and it's a type of animal that's there in the deserts, and they offered it to the Prophet, he didn't eat it. So they thought there was something wrong, they put it on and told him, no. I don't personally prefer it, but you eat it. So what does that mean? That those things, there's no such thing as Kadu Sharif, you know. Pakistan, they have Kadu Sharif, you know. Kadu, yeah. pumpkin. They say it's Kadu Sharif. You know, what you eat, how you live, these in essence are mubah. These are permissible. Because the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, he here, for example, gave that permission. You can eat it. It's not haram. Unless we have evidence to forbid it. So if you wore uh, black today, or if you wore blue today, mubah. you don't have to bring me a dalil why you can wear it. But if you wore a solid red shirt, then I will tell you, Akhi, you can't do this as a man, right? If you wear a cotton or nylon or whatever else, it's fine. But if you wore silk, then I can give you a dalil. But I cannot tell you, oh, you're holding a black cell phone, that's bid'ah. That's got nothing to do with the deen. You could bring a white cell phone, doesn't matter, right? I can't tell you, you have a Samsung, so you get tawab. Or you have an apple, so now, mashallah, you're going to get reward. No. Those things are mubah. They have nothing to do with the deen. But if you, after Asr, when we prayed four rak'ah, if you prayed five, now I would stop you. In Akhir, there's only four rak'ah. This is what Rasulullah showed us. Fadr Habib. Wa alaykum as salam. Munkadir. That's the Mursal Hadith. That's a whole, that's not one lesson, that's like a series of lessons. So before, so he's a, Sorry, I was going to travel to come to America to see you. Allah, Allah. This one, but you Allah can... brought me here to you. Tell you, regarding the hadith that goes up to a sahabi, this is called a mawquf hadith. Uh, I have a series on a Masjid Ribat channel, it's called the Science of Grading Hadith Made Easy. Right? And it's an ikhtisar from Nukhmat al of Ibn Hajar. So you can watch those that are in English, they're easy. And if you watch them, all this will get cleared up. But just since you asked and you came from so far and Allah brought me here for you, I will answer the question anyway. Munkati is a different type of hadith. Mursal is when the sahab is a link between the tabi and Rasul is missing. If a hadith goes up to a sahabi, then this is called a mawquf hadith. They're telling me it's the last question, so khalas, you got in the right time. Regarding mawquf a hadith, they can be acceptable, but there are shurut for it. First thing, I believe the narration you're mentioning is not authentic even up to Abdullah ibn Abbas. That's the first thing. Many Christian preachers bring us narrations, but they're weak or fabricated because they don't care about their religion and they mention anything. Doesn't mean that we are that way. We check the sanat up to the sahaba. Secondly, you have to look at whether the sahaba had khilaf on the issue. If one Sahabi has a Qawl one way, another Sahabi has a Qawl the other way, then neither becomes a Hujjah. But if none of the Sahaba said something, and the Sahabi has a Qawl or a Fi'l, and there's nothing Khalif to it from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or any of the Sahaba, then it could be a Hujjah, right? It's getting a little detailed, but in those issues of Aqa'il, in the issues of belief, we have to check those narrations and figure where did the Sahaba get that because Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, if he brought that type of khabar either he got it from one of the Ahlul Kitab who became Muslim like some of the Jews that became Muslim or he got it from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. We, we, ulema, they have to figure this out before we take it as acceptable or not so each one of those you should go to the people of knowledge and know the verification and inshallah then you will get it do you take any more? Just to add one more. Halas, one more to go. Wa alaykum as
Hayyan. Just on that note, with the Mahmoud narration, it's Kaaba, which is a not necessarily. Not all the time. Not all the time. Let me explain. Um, when a Sahabi brings a narration that has to do with the faith, can you make it marfu'ah? Can you say that they had to have had this knowledge from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Not always, because there are times, and we can prove Sanadan sometimes that people like uh, Abdullah bin Salam or Kaab. Uh, Rahib and others, the uh, Ahbar, when they became Muslim, they brought some of the knowledge from the Ahlul Kitab with them. And some of the Sahaba, like Abdullah ibn Abbas, would at times narrate that knowledge. And if we know that to be true, like sometimes there will be Mokur on uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas, and sometimes Allah ibn will actually say, I heard this from uh, Abdullah ibn Salam, for example, right? In that case, we cannot take it as evidence, because then it will be under Israeliyat. But if there is not, then we give the hukum of rafa because Sahaba would not make up things by themselves. But that tahqiq has to be done by the ulama before we can take it. Barakallah Just to say, uh, last second, um, Wallahi, I love you all for the sake of Allah. And Jazakallah uh, khair. May Allah love you as you love me for his sake. And I'm really happy to be here. And inshallah, I'll be back to the UK. I, I feel more at home here than I do in America. So inshallah, we'll be back. And may Allah keep your unity and love amongst all of us. And may Allah keep you on the khair. And may Allah increase it. The next time I come, this masjid will be completed. And uh, or inshallah, I'll come before that. I don't know. Unless your fundraising is really great, mashallah. And we look forward to seeing you all again. And you have great people of knowledge here and great people of akhlaq. And I encourage you to benefit. The Sheikh is teaching Shah Sunnah. Uh, benefit from his knowledge, it is better than mine. So we ask Allah for you to benefit from those that are here in your community that are better than me. So you come and you bring people to his dars so they can benefit from it. Uh, brothers, just uh, in ending, firstly we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept that from Sheikh Uthman, uh, to return him and his family back safely to their home in the, uh, in the States and keep them safe and preserve them. Um, and also, Ikhwani Fillah, as you look around, subhanAllah, we see that these, uh, these gatherings are blessed because they bring people to the masjid who maybe wouldn't necessarily have come to the masjid. And we see that this masjid, it's not mine or it doesn't belong to anyone else. This masjid is for the community. And there are, uh, you know, every Friday the khutbah here pretty much is done in the English language. Um, you know, you don't need to go and listen to somebody reciting something from a book which he doesn't know what it means and we don't understand what it means come and benefit and there are lessons and there are classes and this is your masjid and every single one of you is welcome to this masjid every single one of you uh, is is you know deserving of this place and we say to our young brothers who have come for Sheikh Uthman Sheikh Uthman will go back and it's like Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu he said when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died he said whoever worshipped Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then know that Muhammad has died whoever worships Allah then know that Allah is ever living and he will not die in other words whilst you know when the speakers come alhamdulillah it's, it's a great event and we love it and it allows us to see our brothers the masjid is still there, the da'wah is still there, the learning is still going on. And the, you know, the Sheikh, he touched on a few topics, but the, the, the madhab or the manhaj of Ahlul Hadith and the methodology of Ahlul Hadith is that we take the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu importantly upon the understanding of the companions. And that's what we're trying to teach here. That's what we're trying to get out to you here. No fairy tales, no hocus pocus. None of that stuff, we want to keep our deen, if it was around and if it was religion at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then it's religion today. If it wasn't religion then, it cannot be religion today. So um, in ending brothers, please don't be strangers, please support your masjid with your dua first and foremost. If you're able to donate, if you're able to bring somebody to the masjid to come to the durus, uh, and we ask Allah to ta'ala that he preserves our Shaykh. 
فجزاكم الله خيرا سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب اليك بليز دونت موف ذا شيخ اون هيز واي اوت بليز